Hello and welcome to Boxer's Shorts. I'm Adam Boxer and I'm a science teacher trying to help you understand more of GCSE science. In these short videos I will try and take difficult concepts from GCSE science, break them down, um, help you understand them and then do some practice questions on those concepts. In terms of some general tips for using these videos, definitely do not have your phone on or anywhere around you. It's a distraction and it means you won't be able to concentrate properly. The same applies for other tabs on your computer. So don't have your social media tabs open on your computer or laptop. It will just distract you. I'm going to ask you to do some questions. If you don't actually do them, you won't actually learn anything. So make sure when I do ask you to do those questions, you do them. And finally, let me know in the comments if there is a topic that you want me to cover. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can subscribe and just let me know if there's something you want me to do for you. All right, today we're going to do some chemistry. We are starting a new topic, which is energy changes in chemical reactions. A reminder before we get started, phones off, notifications off, tabs off, all away. So otherwise you just will not be able to concentrate. Now endothermic and exothermic change or changes are very cool um, because they relate to how the temperature of a chemical reaction takes place. You see there are some reactions which get very, very hot very, very quickly. So for example, um, an explosion or your Bunsen burner. So you light the Bunsen burner, a chemical reaction takes place uh, and it's very, very hot. You don't want to put your finger in that. On the other hand, there are some reactions which get a lot colder when you do them. So you mix two chemicals together and it starts to feel very, very, very cold. What we're going to look at is why that is and what's going on here. Okay, let's start with a really simple example. Let's say I've got a nice big beaker full of substance B. And I take a lump of A and I drop it in. And a chemical reaction takes place. But I don't just leave it the way it is. I also have here a thermometer. And I notice that the temperature on my thermometer goes up. The temperature goes up. Why is this happening? What's going on here? Now, what we can do is let's imagine that we've got A and B as our reactants. They react together, they make something called C. It doesn't really matter what for the minute. All chemicals everywhere in the world, everywhere in the universe, store energy, which means we can think of them as kind of a bit like a battery, like that. A and B store energy, and C stores energy as well. I'm just drawing them, they're like batteries because they store energy, which is what the battery on your phone does. The thing is though, A and B store an absolute ton of energy, but C only stores a little bit of energy in this particular case. So the thing is, I know where this energy has come from. It's come from A and B, right? It's this amount of energy over here. But where's all of this energy gone? Where is it? What's happened? It can't just be destroyed, it can't vanish because of the law of conservation of energy, which says that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can't, it can't just vanish and disappear, it's got to go somewhere. And the answer is, it goes to the surroundings. Some of it goes to C, but some of it goes to what's called the surroundings. And the surroundings means anything that isn't A, B or C anything that isn't A, B or C. So energy goes like this, to the air around, to the air over there, to the air over there. It goes to the table that the beaker's resting on. It goes everywhere. It also goes to the thermometer because the thermometer is part of the surroundings. Is the thermometer A? No. Is the thermometer B? No. Is the thermometer C? No. So it's part of the surroundings. It doesn't matter that it's inside, you know, it's been stuck into B. It's part of the surroundings. It's not B. It's not A, it's not B, it's not C, it's the surroundings. So if energy goes to the thermometer, the temperature on the thermometer goes up. 
because that's what a thermometer does. It takes energy in and it puts the temperature and it shows a higher temperature. It'd be exactly the same if I didn't use a thermometer, I just held it. If I sort of held the beaker like this, my hands would start to feel warm. That's because energy is being transferred from the reaction, so from A and B, to my hands. My hands are part of the surroundings. They're not A, they're not B, they're not C, they are the surroundings. So as soon as they pick up energy, I start to feel that as getting a bit warmer. We call this kind of a reaction an exothermic reaction or change. It's one in which energy is released to the surroundings. All right, let's do another one. Let's say I've got some wool, like just mineral wool, okay? And I take a thermometer and I shove it into the wool. So I've got a bit of wool and the thermometer is like really stuck into it. I then add two liquids. One will be called A and the other will be called B. So I add two liquids to that wool, A and B. The temperature on my thermometer starts to go down. It decreases. Well, what's happened here? Let's say A and B together make C. In this case, C has absolutely tons of energy. But A and B between them have only got a little bit of energy. So the question is, where's the rest of the energy come from? So I see where, you know, this amount of the energy in C has come from. It's come from there. But where's all of this stuff come from? And the answer is, it's come from the surroundings. So this reaction grabs energy from the surroundings and it'll grab energy from everything that's around it including you guessed it the thermometer the surroundings including and if the thermometer is losing energy i.e it's giving the energy in to a and b when they're getting to C, or so that C can store it. If the thermometer is losing energy like that, its temperature is going to go down and it's going to start to feel very cold indeed. The same is true if you were to hold the reaction. If you did this reaction in a test tube, it would start to feel very cold. That's because it's pulling in energy from your hands, i.e. from the surroundings, from everything that's around it you'd feel cold because your hand is losing energy. We call this an endothermic reaction. All right, so I've got here a table that kind of summarizes all the stuff about exothermic and endothermic reactions. Don't read it yet, because I'm gonna walk it through um, and it's gonna be on your screen forever. So you don't need to read it through now. Um, the first bit is about energy, whether it's released to the surroundings for exothermic, taken in from the surroundings, endothermic, you should know that by now, temperature of the surroundings, always, always, always exothermic increases. If the temperature goes up, it's exothermic. It doesn't matter how the particular reaction looks or how they word things in the question. If the temperature goes up, it's exothermic. If the temperature goes down, it's endothermic. Examples, uh, there's two, there's basically four chemical reaction names that you need to know. For those examples, uh, combustion will make more sense to you later on once you've studied um, uh, bu bu the unit on organic chemistry. Respiration should make sense to you already from biology. Endothermic reactions, thermal decomposition, you should know a bit about from the quantitative chemistry unit, that's the unit to do with moles. And then citric acid and sodium hydrogen carbonate is a new one for you, uh, but it's very similar to the kind of volcano thing that you might have seen that kids do. So you dump some sodium hydrogen carbonate into some citric acid and it bubbles and fizzes. It also gets very cold, it's endothermic. You need to know what your syllabus calls day-to-day -day uses. Um, 
these aren't really day-to-day -day uses because uh, I don't even know what self-heating can is and I've never seen one. I think it's basically like a can, like a drinks can with, co with coffee uh, in it. And at the bottom, it's got this little thing that you can press and it starts to heat up by itself. Uh, there are also hand warmers as are clearly not day to day. I mean, I've never used one in my life. And certainly if you're using them day to day in the summer, you might need to see a doctor. Um, endothermic, they're sports related colpex. It's basically if someone uh, gets hit in sport really hard, they'll get a bruise and swelling. And if you put something cold on that really quickly, then the swelling um, goes down. So they have these cold packs, which are like it's like a it's like a pouch and you crunch up the pouch and it starts to get really cold really quickly. And you can put that on a uh, on the injured area. As per usual, we now have some questions to try. Um, so pause the video, have a go at the questions, and then when you're ready, um, press play again and we'll go through the answers. All right, so how do you know if an endothermic reaction is taking place? Because the temperature's going down, <coughs> gone down. Don't say things like, um, because energy has been taken in from the surroundings, because that's not something you can know. You can know the temperature's gone down, and you assume from that, that means that, um, that uh, energy has been taken in from the surroundings, but you can't see energy. So you, that's not a way of knowing that the reaction is taking place. In terms of energy, what's an exothermic reaction? One which releases energy to the surroundings. Uh, in this case, temperature change is 24 degrees. That was question three. Um, question four, that would be exothermic because the temperature goes up. Number five, uh, it starts to feel very cold. It's going to be endothermic. Number six, do the products store more or less energy than reactants? They store more energy, which means they've got to have got that energy from somewhere, which they get from the surroundings, which is why it feels cold. Number seven, energy is taken in from the surroundings, that would be endothermic. Eight, two examples of those reactions. We had combustion and respiration for um, exothermic, and we had sodium hydrogen carbonate citric acid and thermal decomposition for endothermic. And nine, from memory, the uses of endothermic and exothermic reactions. We had the, the um, self-heating cans, we had the hand warmers, and we had uh, the sports injury cold packs. Once again, thank you very much for listening. In the next video, we are going to look at something called a reaction profile. And as ever, please do make sure you subscribe. And if you have any particular topics you want me to cover, just let me know.